Hi, welcome to BNR series. Today we have uh, Hui Ling from uh, Inclusive Value Fund to share with us um, her, her insights into investing. Okay, so thank you Hui Ling for this, coming for this show. Thanks for having me here. Okay, uh, probably you give a little introduction of yourself, your background and why mm. do you start this fund? Okay, so my first career of course is in financial journalism, 22 years in one company, one paper and one employer. So, but of course, all this while, I was quite interested in financial markets and investing. And so I took my CFA and then my Master of Science in Applied Finance. Then after that, I started my column, uh, a weekly investment column called uh, Show Me The Money. So all articles of, of that column has been compiled into eight books. Huh? So then while I was writing the articles, the column, so I've always got like uh, offers from financial institutions to come to me and then asking me if I would like to join them. So along the way, somehow nothing quite worked up uh, until 2013. Then I got this offer to join a startup firm. So like I said, all this while only one job, one employer, just know how to write, right? And then at that point in time, I was given the opportunity to be a, a fund manager to be a partner in a fund management company and to be an entrepreneur. So then I read and I believe it is so that in life we tend to regret things that we didn't do rather than things that we have done. So I took the dive and uh, I guess it's, it's very rewarding in many sense of the word. I've learned a lot, gained a lot of experience, grew as a person and uh, yeah, then last year I took uh, another turn in my life again and I left the partnership and then started my own fund. So this uh, inclusive value fund, right? Mm. Uh, what is the methodology that's driving it? Okay, so it, we call it a quant value fund. So by that we mean that we do a lot of uh, testing, a lot of uh, research to identify factors that will ultimately drive stocks returns over time, right? So once we have identified those uh, factors, then we will try to select stocks that exhibit those kind of like uh, qualities and then we add it to our portfolio. So uh, so uh, our research and that of the academics, we have, they have found that value stocks, stocks that uh, are trading at below uh, their value in terms of whether it's assets that they own or the earnings that they are able to generate, so if you buy the stocks that are cheap in those sense, then over the long term, you're able to generate uh, above normal returns. Lah. So then we go about selecting value stocks, and then we add a layer of a quality criteria to it. So in addition to being cheap, the stocks also need to have uh, low borrowings. They also need to have uh, like be generating cash from the operations and then they also need to be dispersing the cash to investors in as, as dividends and then they also need to have good corporate governance so once the stock meet all these criteria then we'll add those into our portfolio so based on our research uh, a stock uh, a set of stocks that meet all these criteria over the last 10 years have generated more than uh, double digit returns compounded annually so as long as we are able to get stocks that meet those criteria and add them into our portfolio, the closer we are in terms of population to that kind of thing, then the higher the probability that we will generate that kind of returns. So currently we have about 640 stocks in our portfolio and in our universe we have about 14,000 stocks. So we have about 4.5% of the universe in our portfolio right now. And you mentioned about there are two layers, right? Where the first part is primary quantitative and the second part, there's some qualitative checks mm. that you do, right? Mm. So uh, I would assume that most of the work is done quantitatively to decide the stocks, right? That's why you, you say that this is a quant uh, kind of fund. Mm. Uh, if let's say we put in percentage terms, how much percent of that process is quantitative and how much percent of that is qualitative? Actually, even in the qualitative part, there are elements of quantitative in there because we have like scores, right? So this criteria 
if it meets the score, then you give it a point or two points or whatever. Then ultimately you add up, okay. and then yeah, then you rank the stocks, and then so that's a quantitative. So it's still predominant quantitative. Yeah. Uh, probably except the part where you mentioned about corporate governance. Yeah. Where that that is yeah, the difficult smell to score, test, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, sometimes you can yeah, in terms of like accounts receivables or cash flows, etc. Yeah. Okay. So which means you're just trying to see whether you can uh, uh, figure out that whether there are some funny business going on, uh, whether reporting is fraudulent yes, in nature. Yeah. So that's, that's more of a yeah. purpose. Yeah. Correct. Whether like for KPEX, this company, in terms of revenue and the amount that they spend on KPEX, is it justifiable or not? If not, then money could be siph- been siphoned off. Okay. Yeah. So largely quantitative. Mm. And I also know that um, your fund is special in a case that it doesn't have any management fees, mm. right, which is well, very rare in this uh, financial industry. Right? Yeah. Uh, you only charge performance fee. Uh, why do you structure it this way? Okay, so because we have done our research and we are confident of the process because we see that it does generate the returns, right? So we are willing to take the risk and show investors that we have skin in the game as well. So if we don't generate returns for you, then we get zero and we have to fork up money from our own pockets to pay for all the expenses incurred in running the fund, right? So I guess also people like fairness. From the uh, investor point of view, if I don't make money, why should I pay you, the fund manager, right? Or worse still, if I lose money. So, But if you make me money, then I'm more than happy to share my profit with you. So that's why we come up with a structure like this. And uh, the controversial part is probably, let's say, uh, in a downturn, right, mm. the market is not doing well, uh, you may not receive performance fees for a number of years, mm. uh, and you uh, have to probably cough up the operating expenses mm. in this case, right? Yeah. Uh, are you concerned about this? Okay, so we deal with this uh, on three fronts. Firstly, of course, I said we uh, try to buy stocks that are really cheap, right? So if, say, a company owns buildings, properties, they have cash, they have like financial assets, etc. And then after taking away all the liabilities, it's worth $1 per share. We only want to pay like 50 cents for that kind of company. So we have that um, quite fat margin of safety. So even if like, oh, okay, so even if you pay 50 cents for something that's worth $1, there's no guarantee that you will not go to 40 cents, 30 cents, right? So that's when you have like uh, systemic risk, yeah, macro uncertainties. So for those cases, for those events, we know that it's going to be temporarily lost. Yeah, market will rebound and it will not last like a long time. So that's one. And then the second part, of course, is like when we cannot find anything cheap to buy, right? So then we will actually want to hold a little bit more cash. Yeah. So when we hold uh, more cash, then when the markets come down, then we have the uh, ammunition to kind of like pick up some stocks. Uh. Uh, prolonged decline will only happen when valuations are at lofty levels, right? So at depressed levels, it's quite unlikely that uh, market will be staying lo- uh, down and going even further for long. So that's the second part. And then third part, of course, over the long term, the market trend is up, right? So over the last 40 years, 60% of the months is the up month for the markets, and then 40% is down months. So the odds are in our favor, right? And also in the 40 years, in the past 40 years, we haven't seen any prolonged, like sustained decline for more than two and a half years. So as long as we make sure that we have enough reserves to last us through at least three years, then I think we should be fine. Okay. So in other words, uh, there are many, many layers of uh, protection in Correct. the sense, yeah. right? And uh, uh, based on history, down markets is, is not as prolonged as what people think it is. Mm-hmm. Probably, as you say, you set aside three years of operating expenses, you cover it. Uh, mm. Even when the market worse days come, you'll mm. still be able to, to tie it through. La. Correct. And the strategy will take care of by itself because uh, as the market becomes more expensive, you actually hold more cash. Yes. So it's easier to recover. Uh, with that kind of uh, ammunition to buy more cheaper stocks. Okay, yeah. Forward. And also, like, if, as the market comes down, and if we think that the market is cheap enough, then we'll try to encourage our investors to put in more mm. money and pick up, like, yeah, things on the cheap. So when market rebounds, then we are also able to earn a little bit of fees from there. Okay. 
because uh, that that probably will be the best time to invest, right? Mm, That's correct, definitely. During the market crash, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you'll take and some the time worst for it thing to recover. is to sell at the bottom of the market. <laughs> exactly, right? So, uh, does it mean if let's say someone buy during a market crash, right? Okay, after a market crash, okay, they bought in at a very low price into the fund, mm. and. Uh, I also understand that there's this high water mark that you need to maintain before you start charging performance fee, right? So, yeah. uh, which means the new investor at that point in time can probably uh, ride it free without no, no, paying no, any no, fees. No, 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 no. Okay, <laughs> so it's at the investor level. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So, depending on where you come in, so you pay for the performance that you enjoy. So, if you see, come in at the low point and then we get all the way back up to the last high water mark, then you have to pay that difference. I see. Yeah. So, the water mark is based on individual investor it's not based on the fund level it's based on the fund level but investors once it get back up to that last uh, high water mark then this person will have to pay ah, up to that level yeah yeah so we know that there are many investors among our audience and mm. they invest their own money right? right and there's always this belief that uh, the institutions and the funds have more advantages than an individual investor mm. uh, do you agree with that and are there any ways that uh, individual investors should do to increase their probability of wins? Yeah. So I don't entirely agree with that statement because, of course, smaller investors, you're nimbler, right? So you can buy into small cap stocks which are cheap, which big institutions cannot buy into because they are just too huge. But, of course, the other downside for investors is that if your fund size is limited, then you cannot diversify as widely as you would like to, right? At, in a cost-effective way. So if you don't diversify enough, then the risk for your portfolio may be higher. Mm. So there, there are pros and cons to yeah, being small. Okay. Yeah. So your, your recommendation is that uh, look at where the big funds are not investing mm, in. Correct. That's where the advantage is yes, for the Yes, issue. yes. But make sure that you diversify enough. Okay. Don't like you like one stock and just put everything you have in that one particular stock not one big bet <laughs> <laughs> because yeah a lot of things can be random so things can go wrong yeah things unexpected can happen so okay. but the key is always never overpay hmm. right yeah so you want the value correct perspective, yes right? yes okay. yeah and uh, we know that investors like to choose fund managers. Right? Mm-hmm. They like to impose criteria or like this manager to do this and do that, right? So now let's flip it around and say that you get to choose your investor. Right. What, what is the kind of ideal investor you're looking at? Okay, the ideal investor for us would be someone who really understands our process, right? And someone who... Uh, is not the G3 type who will not panic when uh, there's short-term volatility because as we always say volatility is the price to pay for higher returns from equities and then uh, best still if this someone is willing or be ready to put in money when the market is down so that's the ideal and also have a longer term horizon not the short-term trading type basically somebody who will just park money and top up and top up (laughs) And just to clarify, uh, the fund is only open to accredited investors, yes. uh, so as per MAS uh, definition. Not top up and top up, but top up with the intention of withdrawing at some point in the okay. future. And then when you withdraw, you don't have to take out everything. You can take it out piecemeal, like on a regular basis, right? Every year you take out like 50000 for your spending money. enjoy yes. the retirement. Yes. Early retirement. Correct. Okay. I think we have time, so I will just go on to the next mm. question, right? Okay. Okay. And we know that this financial industry has a lot of uh, men, mm. fe- male-dominated, right? So being a female in this field, uh, do you feel any way disadvantaged? Mm. So that's the reason why I set up my own, right? <laughs> so, <can. laughs> so I can set up, create my own culture within my own team, so I can set my own direction, my value system, yeah. Okay, okay. and it's quite phenomenal in the sense that uh, you are able to raise about about hundred million uh, as under management in a short time, less than a year, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think are some of the success factors that made this happen? Okay, so I think there are a few factors that contributed to to this. One, of course, is our fair uh, 
(uh) incentive structure right so (ppb) it's a win win for investors and for us and secondly of course (uh) people have known me they have read my articles they know my investment process and it's a good process (ppb) and they know that I am quite diligent in doing all my research and quite sound in my analysis (ppb) and then thirdly of course (uh) there's been kind of like (uh) evidence in how the process has worked in the previous fund that I was with (ppb) so then people got the confidence in us despite the fact that we are new because we are employing pretty similar process (ppb) so fourthly (uh) there are some investors who like to join a fund right from the inception so we offer them that opportunity to do that (ppb) but with some added comfort level in that they have known me for (uh) I'm someone who's been in the industry for close to thirty years (ppb) and then (uh) someone who has been spending time studying the market and continuously trying to learn new things from the market (ppb) and someone who is not in it for a quick buck do you agree that being a woman (mm) (uh) it actually has an advantage in this case because women are research has shown that women are better investors than men yes so I was gonna say that so (ppl) (laughs) and I think women do do some of your clients believe that that's why they entrust (uh) you the (uh) for clients I don't think the gender is an issue [lah] yeah but personally I feel that because women tend to be less egoistic and ya so more willing to listen to other people and then maybe more em~ empathy more yeah. meticulous right yeah. like, like really yeah. looking into the numbers right and right and more evidence based and not not stick to one idea just because my 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 views are set the on ego this is too yeah big, yeah so. correct okay okay and if let's say someone among the audience is equity investor he, he or she wants to get to know about your fund mm. how he or she should contact you uh you can just go to our website and the website is uh, inclusive i n c l u s i f dot com dot s g we have some materials there if they like to carry the conversation forward then they can drop us an email or just fill up the form okay. yeah so it's uh, inclusive the the sp- uh, spelling is a bit different right it's s i f at the back okay so we we'll get it right and uh thank you for waiting for the insights uh, Thank you for coming for the show. Thanks, Alvin, for having me here. Thank you.